Okay, so we've talked about moments in general, uh, that it is the a physical force Q times uh, a distance R to some exponent N. So the general form is Q R to the N. And we said, hey, the moment of inertia that we know from dynamics, that's actually the second moment of mass. And torque uh, that we know from def bods and statics, that's actually the first moment of force. We're going to talk now about something that's really crucial in def bods, which is uh, the moment of area. So the moment of area is a special case where the quality Q is just one. Uh, and what we're doing is um, finding the sum, the integral of the area at any given point times the distance of that area from some axis. Okay, one example of that is this is a centroid. Okay, the centroid is the axis around which the first moment of area is zero. So it's important here that the first moment of area can be negative. R can be negative or positive, right? If R, if N is two, uh, then your moment is always going to be positive. But in this case, C is my centroid here. Basically, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to measure this area here. Um, that's going to have a positive X value and a positive Y value. That is my R vector. Um, and that's going to add positive values to the moment of area. Over here, if my axis again is C, then I've got negative X and negative Y out values for R. Uh, and that's going to give me negative values. And so the sum of all of these areas, the amount of the area times the distance R um, is going to be zero. And that's what defines uh, our centroid. Okay, those X and positive and negative values are going to um, cancel out when we measure from the centroid. So that's the first moment of area that we use to determine the centroid. Now, if we want to figure that out uh, realistically, um, a lot of times we can just use symmetry, right? I know that the centroid of a rectangle is going to be right in the center of the rectangle. Easy peasy, right? Um, if I have to find something like this, then I do need to take an integral, and we're not going to do that in practice. But really, it's, it's, it's important to notice that these are not particularly uh, complicated um, uh, equations. They look sort of fancy, but really all you're doing is taking a weighted average of each distance, right? So I'm, I'm going to measure, you know, um, my area here times my distance. I'm going to divide it by my area. Um, and that's going to, if I uh, sum all those up, this guy, the integral of dA over a is just A. It's just your area. Um, and so really what we're doing is we're just sort of making sure that the, that the, where the, or measuring where the points are in terms of their X. We're finding an average X um, for that, for that body. If I have multiple bodies, I can do that in a, in a simpler way um, and figure out, uh, the sum of each of my bodies. So this is the sum of, so for in this case, it would be the sum of the area here times the X value of the centroid. Um, and then I would sum that with the area of this guy times the X value of its centroid. 
um, and divide the whole thing uh, by the areas of both of them. So in Y here, um, Y bar here is my centroid of my of object one, and that's five inches. I would multiply that times the area of object one. I would take Y2 here, I would multiply it by the area of Y2. That would be the top of my equation, just the sum of those two products. And then the bottom would be the sum of the area of object one and the sum of the object of object two. Uh, and I'd get an answer Y bar, which would be the centroid of these two objects together. Okay, which as you might guess, is now you might ask, what's the difference between a centroid and the center of mass? Uh, the centroid is the point where the first moment of area is zero. And the center of mass is where the first moment of mass is zero. Now, if our material is homogeneous, that is, it has the same density throughout its body, then those are identical. Okay. Um, and so it, if with uh, finding the centroid, we don't need to worry about a quantity Q. Um, if we found the center of mass, we'd have to worry about that quantity of Q. But again, if that's the same everywhere, then that's then uh, the problem is going to affect the, those Qs are going to divide out. Um, and we're going to find that the center of mass is the same as the centroid. Um, when we start calculating for buckling and bending and torsional stresses, we use a number of different moments of inertia. Now this drives me bananas, um, but <laughs> these are not really moments of inertia. They are second moments of area, right? You can see here that our Q is one in each of these cases. Um, and you can see that they're both second order because our distance is squared. This one is around a single point. This is around the x-axis and this is around the y-axis. Now, why do we call them moments of inertia? Despite the fact they have nothing to do with inertia, I don't have a good answer to that. It's generally clear in context. Um, in this class, we don't really deal with the moment of inertia of dynamics, the second moment of area of, of mass, almost everything that we do is the second moment of area. So if you see the phrase moment of inertia in this class, um, you know that it's that second moment of area. If you see it elsewhere, you have to kind of figure out whether you're talking about um, deformation or whether you're talking about uh, angular momentum. It's usually pretty clear, uh, but it, it could be better. <laughs> All right, so these are second moments of area around a, a point in a line, and there's a nice relationship between the two of them, right? If I add these two together, I get this one. Now, notice these are always positive, right? X squared and Y squared mean that all the negatives get, we get rid of them. Um, they can be zero only if all of the mass is along that axis. So they're almost always going to be a positive non-zero number. Uh, and this is also going to be a positive non-zero number. You can look these up. I put a properties of plane areas on uh, Moodle that you can use, but you can also just look them up uh, pretty readily if you uh, need them for a problem. Now, if we have a complex shape, we need to uh, deal with that a little differently, right? So here we have that same complex shape we were dealing with before. If I want to know the second moment of area for this, I can sum the parts, right? So what's my I total? Uh, it's going to be, let's say, if I wanted my I X total, it would be the I X of this object plus the I X of that object. Now you can see that that is going to create a problem because we don't have this x axis does not go through the centroid here or through the centroid there. And so you're not going to be able to look that up on a table even to figure out what the i of this object is. And here we use the parallel axis theorem. You might remember that we probably just barely touched on it in, um, 
in uh, what would be 211, I guess. Um, but the parallel axis theorem basically is stated like this. And this says that, let's take this rectangle up here. The ix of this rectangle is going to be the ix of that rectangle through the centroid. So I can look that up, right? If I want to figure out what my ix through that is. Plus, and this is the parallel axis, um, the area of this object times the distance between the axis of rotation and my axis here. Okay, so my dx here would be, what would that, uh, uh, like 2.95, right? It would be this distance, that would be my d squared. My a would be the area of the rectangle. And then my i would be the ix of this object around that centroidal axis right there. So I'd look this up, find the area of the rectangle, and find the distance from the actual axis that I'm interested in. Oh, I could have looked at my notes and I would have seen that it was 2.95. So make sure you can understand how to, how to use that because we'll use that, the parallel axis uh, theorem on, on occasion.